Hi, I'm Jeff Wolf from Experimental Pathology Laboratories in Sterling, Virginia, and I'm here to talk to you today about diseases of fish. I'd like to get started on the first slide, please. First, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people who helped me put this talk together. Dr. Robert Muller, Dr. Christine Densmore, Dr. John Grizzle, Dr. Lester Koo, Dr. Stephen A. Smith, and Dr. Marilyn Wolf. The topics that I'd like to cover today, first I'd like to talk about some general principles of fish pathology, and then we're going to get into the actual fish diseases, including viral, bacterial, mycotic, superficial external protozoan, invasive or internal protozoan, metazoan, neoplastic, nutritional, and miscellaneous. So first, some general principles of fish pathology. The first question I want to ask you is, what caused this? This is exophthalmus in a channel catfish fingerling. The answer is, it's either viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, or other. Well, what caused this? These are white spots on a fingerling trout. It could be either viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, or other. Here's some other lesions. A proliferative lesion on the fin of a sucker, abdominal distension in a carp, and a dermal ulcer in a flounder. What caused these? I think you get the picture. Viral, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, or other. The bottom line is you can't tell from the gross appearance of many lesions. There are very few fish lesions that are pathognomonic. For example, this lesion on a dace, this large swelling of the head, it's not a tumor. It happens to be a mixozoan parasite cyst. So if many diseases look the same, how do you make the diagnosis? One cue you can use is environmental conditions, and an experienced fish diagnostician will know according to the season, the temperature, and the oxygen concentration, sometimes what's causing the disease before the fish even comes into the laboratory. You know what uh, diseases that the species of fish that you're concerned with are susceptible to. You know what diseases are endemic to your area. You look at wet mounts of biopsies such as gill clips, fin snips, and skin scrapings. You do bacterial culture, perform viral culture and serologic testing. And finally, you do histopathology. For you mammalian pathologists, the same pathological processes occur in fish. For example, degenerative, inflammatory, neoplastic, metabolic, nutritional, immunologic, toxicologic, heritable genetic, and anomalous. Uh, for examples of anomalous, we have a congenital aplasia of the operculum in this perch and congenital microophthalmia in this tilapia. There are some anatomical differences between mammals and fish, obviously, however. For example, mammals have lungs, haired skin, lymph nodes, bone marrow, adrenal glands, salivary glands, mammary glands, whereas fish have gills, scale skin, swim bladders, pseudobranchs, hepatopancreases, corpuscles of stanius, ultimobranchial bodies, and lateral line systems. You also need to be aware that fish are not all the same. It's difficult to make generalizations about fish since there are greater than 20,000 different fish species. Some anatomic differences among fishes include the Japanese madaka has no true stomach, salmonids have pyloric cica, catfish have divided head and trunk kidneys, striped bass has a hepatopancreas, menhaden have a gizzard, flounder have no swim bladder, Guppies have embryos. As we talk about fish diseases, obviously in an hour and a half, I cannot discuss every fish disease. Therefore, I'm going to focus on classic diseases, recent notable diseases, and diseases with nice photos. A few diseases are not in your handout. Oh, no. I will try to point these out. And I'm not going to talk about treatment because uh, we don't really have the time, and a lot of the information is already in your handout. So now we're going to jump into the fish diseases. We're going to start with viral diseases. The first disease we're going to look at, we see a white growth on the, on the fin of a cichlid. We see white growths on the face of a walleye pike. And if we look at a photomicrograph of the skin, we see markedly swollen dermal fibroblasts. This is lymphocystis. The agent is an irritavirus. Susceptibility, most, most freshwater and saltwater fishes are susceptible to this disease. Uh, history and findings, white to yellow cauliflower-like growths. Occasionally, this disease will manifest systemically. It's often stress-induced and self-limiting. Uh, histopathologically, fibroblasts undergo massive cytomegaly with basophilic cytoplasmic inclusion bodies and a thick outer hyaline capsule. The inflammatory response is variable. This virus gains entry through epidermal abrasions, and the virus infects dermal fibroblasts. 
The next disease we're going to look at, uh, we're looking at some fingerling trout with abdominal distension and uh, a, syn a syncytial cell in the pancreas. This is herpes virus salmonis, or herpes virus disease of salmonids. The agent, of course, is a herpes virus. Susceptibility, this disease is primarily seen in rainbow trout fry. Uh, another herpes virus causes ep uh, epizootic epitheliotrophic disease in lake trout. Uh, history and findings, fish present lethargic with prominent gill pallor. There are mucoid fecal casts. We have exophthalmus and ascites, low hematocrit and numerous immature erythrocytes, and often see hemorrhage in the eyes and the base of the fins. Histopathologically, we see necrosis of the myocardium, liver, kidney, and posterior gut, often leading to cast formation. And this is important to note that syncytia of pancreatic acinar cells has been re reported as a pathognomonic lesion for this disease. The transmission of this disease is believed to be direct. The next disease we're going to talk about, we see some fingerling catfish with abdominal distension and more fingerling catfish with secondary bacterial infection, which happens to be columnaris disease infection in this particular case. We also, if we look at the cell culture, we see cytopathic effect. This is channel catfish virus. Channel catfish virus is another herpes virus. Fry or fingerling ch uh, channel catfish less than 10 gram weight are the most susceptible, and the disease tends to occur during the summer when water temperatures are above 22 degrees centigrade. Uh, fish present with erratic swimming or spiraling followed by terminal lethargy. The mortality in this disease is very high. We see hemorrhage at the base of the fins and skin, ascites, exophthalmus, and pale gills are other findings. The kidneys are often swollen and pale with hemorrhage. The spleen is enlarged and dark red, and the gills are usually pale. Microscopically, we see multifocal necrosis and hemorrhage in the caudal kidney, liver, intestines, and spleen. Transmission of, the, of this disease is supposed to be direct via water or feed. Pisciferous birds, snakes, or turtles may be mechanical vectors, and transovarian transmission is suspected. Survivors are persistently infected and become carriers. In this next disease, we have carp skin with an epidermal plaque and a goldfish spleen with cariomegalic inclusions. This is carp pox, otherwise known as fish pox or epithelioma papillosum. The agent here is, a her is herpes virus cyprinae or cyprinid herpes virus 1. It's a non-fatal disease in carp and other cyprinids of worldwide distribution. History and findings include elevation of the epidermis with white to yellow plaques. The lesions appear in cold weather and regress in summer. Healed, ye healed lesions usually turn black. Histopathologically, we have epidermal hyperplasia with occasional cowdery type A intranuclear inclusion bodies within epithelial and other cells. Transmission of this disease has not been fully worked out. However, it's probably direct. In the next, this next disease, we're looking at a, a photomicrograph of a rainbow trout kidney with hematopoietic tissue necrosis. And now we're looking at a trout pancreas with necrosis. This is infectious hematopoietic necrosis virus. Inf infectious hematopoietic necrosis is caused by a rhabdovirus. Fry of rainbow trout and salmon uh, are usually affected with up to 100% mortality. The, the, the disease is most severe at 10 degrees Celsius and is rare at temperatures above 15 degrees Celsius. History and findings include lethargy or hyperactivity. We see increased dermal pigmentation, exophthalmus, ab abdominal distension, and fecal casts. Hemorrhages occur in the skin and viscera. The fishes are often anemic, and, uh, which is evidenced by their pale gills. We see scoliosis in surviving fish. Histopathologically, we have necrosis in a variety of tissues, including the hematopoietic tissue, macrophage aggregates in the kidney, splenic red pulp, and the hepatic parenchyma. Here's something to note. Necrosis of the gut submucosal eosinophil granular, granular cells are considered pathognomonic for IHN, but this lesion can also be observed in other systemic viral diseases. Intranuclear and intracytoplasmic inclusions are occasionally seen in pancreatic acinar and islet cells. The transmission is by direct contact with infected survivors or contaminated feed. The virus is probably shed in contaminated semen and eggs, and ectoparasites such as leeches may play a role in the transmission. In this next disease, we have a trout with pale muscle and rainbow trout kidney with tubular and hematopoietic necrosis. This is viral hemorrhagic septicemia. This is caused by a rhabdovirus. Uh, this is a widespread disease, very contagious, of rainbow trout. It's a serious disease in Europe. It affects both freshwater and seawater salmonids. 
The disease tends to occur at temperatures below 14 degrees Celsius. Turbo, turbot, sea bass, and Atlantic salmon are commonly affected by similar but not identical viruses. In the acute form of this disease, we see high mortality in affected fish. Pale gills, dark coloration, ascites, exophthalmus, and erratic swimming behavior, such as spiraling. Hemorrhage is common in the eyes, skin, and skeletal muscles, and serosal surfaces of the intestines. Necrosis of hematopoietic tissues is seen, and congestion and necrosis of the liver. In the chronic form, we see a, a slower prolonged course toward mortality. The fish are lethargic, have pale, anemic gills, darkened skin, exophthalmus, and abdominal distension. Splenomegaly, hepatomegaly, and renomegaly are also common findings. The transmission of VHS is supposed to be uh, direct with contacts of carriers, contact of carriers and contaminated water of feed. Vertical transmission has not been reported. This next disease, we see carp with abdominal distension, hemorrhagic dermal and fin ulcers, and hemorrhagic fecal material. This is spring viremia of carp, carp, also known as swim bladder infection virus. SVC SBI is caused by several subtypes of rhabdovirus carpio. So this is another rhabdovirus. In a syndrome known as infectious dropsy of carp, it is actually caused by two agents. Rhabdovirus carpio is now known to be responsible for the acute phase, which is called spring viremia, whereas the chronic phase, which is called carp erythrodermatitis, is caused by secondary infections by atypical Eremonas salmonicida bacteria. This disease occurs in carp and other cyprinids. Findings include a loss of coordination and equilibrium. Acute mortalities occur in the spring and summer. We see exophthalmus and abdominal distension due to ascites. There is an, the vent is, is, is inflamed and swollen. We have edema and hemorrhage in many organs. Enteritis and peritonitis are common. In SBI, we see pronounced inflammation and hemorrhage of the swim bladder. Transmission of this disease, uh, the virus is shed in the feces and found in contaminated eggs. It can be transmitted by the fish louse, argilla species, and leeches. Okay, this next, in this next viral disease, uh, we see rainbow trout with focal hemorrhage and pale organs. And if we look at the rainbow trout pancreas, we see necrosis. This is infectious pancreatic necrosis virus. This is a burn of virus, and most salmonids are susceptible, but primarily rainbow trout and brook trout. The history and, fi and findings, this is characterized by a sudden explosive outbreak with high mortality. Fish become dark and rotate their bodies while swimming. We see abdominal distension and exophthalmus. Hemorrhage and pale organs are common. Gelatinous material is, off, material is often present in the stomach and anterior intestine is highly suggestive. Mucoid fecal casts are common. We have a low hematocrit and hemorrhage in the gut, pi, primarily near the pyloric cica. Histopathologically, we see necrosis of the pancreatic asini, gut mucosa, and renal hematopoietic tissue. We have moderate inflammation of the pancreatic asini. Highland degeneration of skeletal muscle is common. This disease can be transmitted vertically in the eggs. IPN has also been identified or experimentally induced in numerous species of non-salmonid fishes. These infections are seldom accompanied by illness, however. Non-salmonid fishes may act as reservoirs for infection. For this next disease, unfortunately, I don't have any photographs to show you, but this is such an up-and-coming and important disease that I would like to talk about it. This is infectious salmon anemia, ISA, hemorrhagic kidney syndrome. The agent of this disease is an orthomyxovirus. It was first recognized in Norway in the mid-1980s and has since been identified in North and South America. Uh, susceptibility. This disease appears to be limited to an Atlantic salmon. The trout are infected experimentally, but exhibit minimal, if any, deleterious effects. Mortality in Atlantic salmon is variable, but can be high. In this disease, we see lethargy, pale gills due to hemolytic anemia, and exophthalmus two to four weeks after experimental infection. In natural infections, sudden death may occur without any other clinical signs. We see hemorrhage in the kidney, various other organs, and abdominal mesentery. Abdominal fluid and splenomegaly are common. Histopathologically, the virus appears to target endothelial cells, causing interstitial hemorrhage, tubular degeneration and necrosis, and tubular casts in the caudal kidney. Necrosis in other organs also occurs due to vascular impairment. Transmission of this disease is via infected fish or contaminated equipment or human handlers. Sea lice are thought to play a significant role. In this next disease, we're looking at the, the abdominal cavity of a largemouth bass, and what we see here is an, an overinflated, opaque 
swim bladder. This is largemouth bass virus. This is caused by an iridovirus that was first identified in bass from the Santee Cooper Reservoir in South Carolina in 1995, but this disease was also isolated from archival samples taken from Florida bass in 1989. This disease primarily affects wild largemouth bass as opposed to bass within the hatcheries in the eastern United States. The virus has been found in other fish species but has not been associated with disease. The disease affects a, a, a larger fish preferentially, so the trophy bass are the ones that are taken out. Crowding and fluctuations in water quality tend to predispose to disease. This disease is reportedly responsible for fish kills, which usually occur during summer and can last for up to two to three months. The virus replicates well at 30 degrees Celsius centigrade. Fish are found floating more abundant at the water surface. Histopathologically, the lesions are not pathognomonic. Congestion, hemorrhage, and or overflation of the swim bladder are seen. This disease also has a predilection for endothelial cells. Secondary bacterial and parasitic infections are common. Transmission, lateral transmission is thought to be likely. Juvenile and healthy adults may harbor this virus, and recovered fish may be immune. So now we'd like to switch out from the, from the viral diseases and start talking about bacterial diseases of fish. The first disease, we see dermal, ulcer, dermal ulcers in a muscle lunge and channel catfish with dermal ulcers. This is Aramonas hydrophila, also known as bacterial hemorrhagic septicemia, and red sore. The agent is a gram-negative modal rod. A variety of other modal aeromonids can also cause problems similar to Aramonas hydrophila in freshwater fishes and other vertebrates. Susceptibility, most common, this is the most common bacterial disease of freshwater fish. Stress, overcrowding, high temperatures, and or anoxia predispose to this disease. Signs and lesions are variable. Most common are hemorrhage in the skin, fins, oral cavity and muscle, and superficial epidermal ulceration. Occasionally, we see cavitary ulcers of the muscle, similar to Aramona salmonicida infections. Exophthalmus, ascites, splenomegaly, and renomegaly are also common. Histopathologically, we see multifocal necrosis in the spleen, liver, kidney, and heart with numerous bacteria. The diagnosis is made via culture of the organism from affected animals. However, since this is a common water saprophyte uh, with substantial variation in virulence, a positive culture does not always equal uh, a, a positive diagnosis. Transmission of this disease occurs via contaminated water or diseased fish. Unlike Aramonas salmonicida, these bacteria are ubiquitous in the environment. Here we have a photograph of a salmon with deep dermal and muscle ulcers, a goldfish with deep ulcers, and a salmon kidney with necrosis with intralesional gram-negative bacteria. This is Aramonas salmonicida, otherwise known as furunculosis or ulcerative disease of goldfish. This is another gram-negative non-modal short rod. It's probably an obligate pathogen, but it can survive for long periods off of the host. Primarily, salmonids are susceptible, but other freshwater fish can be affected, for example, goldfish. This disease may present as a septicemia with hemorrhage in the muscles and other sites. The major lesion of this fish is a subcutaneous swelling that often causes an ulcerative dermatitis. In the chronic disease, these lesions may create cavities in the adjacent musculature that are called furuncles. In the septicemic form of the disease, we see splenomegaly, ascites, and swelling of the kidneys. Histopathologically, we have necrosis of affected tissues with abundant bacterial colonies and, flu infl and few inflammatory cells due to the bacteria's leukocytolytic exotoxin. In fry, we may only see necrosis of the cardi cardiac atrial endothelium well, without any other lesions. Transmission of this disease is by direct contact with diseased fish, contaminated water, fomites, and through infected eggs. For this next disease, we're looking at a, photo a photograph of a roach with dermal and fin hemorrhage. This is Pseudomonas fluorescens, also known as fin rot. The agent is a short modal gram-negative rod with polar flagella. Several Pseudomonas species can cause similar septicemic disease in a wide variety of freshwater fishes. This, is, this particular bacteria is often pathogenic at low temperatures. Another related bacterium, Pseudomonas anguloseptica, causes serious systemic disease in Japanese eels that is characterized by particular hemorrhage on the fins and tail and skin ulcers. The lesions of, of Pseudomonas are similar to Aramonas hydrophila in that the septicemia is associated with hemorrhage of the fins and tails and skin ulcers. 
Histopathologically, very similar to Aeromonas hydrophila, and transmission is via contaminated water or diseased fish. For this next disease, we have a striped bass with deep dermal ulcers, a summer flounder with deep dermal ulcers, and a summer flounder with exophthalmus. This is Vibrio disease. The agent is a gram-negative rod, which is primarily marine. It's considered to be the marine analog of Aeromonas species. It survives readily in the environment. All marine fish are probably susceptible to at least one species of Vibrio. This is one of the most important bacterial diseases of saltwater fish in captivity. Handling and environmental stressors are thought to be predisposing factors. In the Vibrio septicemia form of this disease, which is caused by Vibrio algonoliticus, Vibrio anguinolarum, or Vibrio salmonocyta, the lesions are similar to Aeromonas hydrophila. We have hemorrhage in the tail and fins, muscles, and serosal surfaces of the viscera. Skin ulcers are common. The spleen may be enlarged and bright red. We, see, we may see necrosis of the liver, kidney and spleen, and occasionally the gut mucosa. The chronic form presents as organized granulomatous inflammation throughout the deep skeletal musculature of the body and head. Another disease caused by Vibrio damsella is ulcer disease of damselfish. In that disease, we see deep skin ulcers and necrotizing myositis. The lesions are similar to Aeromonas salmonocyta infection. Another disease caused by Vibrio species is Hitra disease or cold water vibriosis, and this is caused by Vibrio salmonocyta. This disease affects sea culture in Atlantic salmon in Europe and North America. Outbreaks occur in winter when water temperatures are below 5 degrees centigrade. We see per acute death or chronic hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic septicemia with anemia. Transmission of this disease, uh, Vibrios are ubiquitous in the marine environment, although the most pathogenic strains are isolated from animal hosts. For this next disease, we see two striped bass with multifocal skin and fin hemorrhage. This is, this, these lesions were caused by Edwardsiella tarda. Edwardsiella tarda is a gram-negative modal pleomorphic curved rod. In channel catfish, and usually when we think about Edwardsiella, we think about catfish. In channel catfish, we see outbreaks when water temperature is around 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, Edwardsiella tarda affects primarily older channel catfish, but can also affect fingerling catfish, goldfish, golden shiners, largemouth bass, striped bass, tilapia, and brown bullhead, among others. This is one of the most serious diseases involving the Asian eel culture. History and findings are similar to Aeromonas hydrophila, in which we see hemorrhage and small ulcers in both the skin and muscle. Muscle lesions often develop into large gas-filled malodorous cavities, and the gas is due to hydrogen sulfide production. Diseased fish lose control over the posterior half of their bodies, yet continue to feed. Usually, this disease is associated with low mortality. Histopathologically, we see petechiation and necrosis of the viscera with a fibrinous peritonitis. This disease has been isolated, this uh, bacterium has been isolated from many species of fish, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates, which may function as reservoirs. Edwards yellow tarda is also a potential zoonotic pathogen for humans. Uh, this next disease that we're going to discuss affects pretty much solely catfish. So all the pictures here are of catfish. And we, what we see is abdominal distension, focal hepatitis, more focal hepatitis, which is more granulomatous in this particular liver, peritonitis, exophthalmus, gram-negative rods and renal macrophages, and the signature lesion of this disease, which is frontal bone necrosis. This is Edwardsiella ictleri, also known as enteric septicemia of catfish, or for obvious reasons, hole in the head disease. Uh, don't get confused, this is one of three hole, head, hole in the head diseases of fish. The agent is a gram-negative modal pleomorphic curved rod. Uh, primarily fingerling and yearling catfish are susceptible. This is the most important disease affecting channel catfish, but other types of catfishes and unrelated species are also occasionally affected. The outbreaks are highly seasonally dependent and tend to occur when water temperatures are between 24 and 28 degrees centigrade. This disease closely resembles other systemic bacterial infections. The most characteristic external lesion is the presence of a raised or open ulcer on the frontal bone of the skull between the eyes. Microscopically, we see aneritis, hepatitis, myositis, and interstitial nephritis, which can be acute to chronic. Entrance, entrance of the bacteria occurs through the nasal root, leading to a chronic infection of the olfactory lobe of the brain, causing meningoencephalitis that results in necrosis of the overlying bone. 
This disease, this bacterium can survive for long periods in pond mud and may be latent in the gut of asymptomatic catfish. This next photograph is of a rainbow trout with oral hemorrhage and oral necrosis. This is Yersinia ruckeri, which is also known as enteric red mouth disease. The agent is a gram-negative modal rod, and primarily salmonids are susceptible. Rainbow trout are the most susceptible. This disease has a worldwide distribution and has also been isolated from other fish species, either asymptomatic or diseased fish. Yersinia ruckeri infections often begin as low-level mortality that eventually escalate. The extent of the disease depends upon the strain pathogenicity and the degree of environmental stress that the fish is susceptible to. Septicemia with exophthalmus, ascites, hemorrhage, and ulcers of the jaw, palate, gills, and operculum are common. Hemorrhage also occurs in the musculature and cirrhosis surfaces of the intestines. Splenomegaly and renomegaly are typical findings. Histopathologically, we have numerous bacterial colonies and inflammatory cells in multiple areas of necrosis involving the liver, spleen, kidney, and intestinal mucosa, and in the intestines is often accompanied by a catarrhal exudate. Uh, Yersinia ruckeri infections are transmitted by direct contact with diseased or carrier fish and contaminated water. The bacteria persist in asymptomatic non-somonid fish and in some birds. Carriers are the most important source of infection, although the organism is widespread in freshwater environments. In this next disease, we see ophthalmitis in the tilapia, peri and myocarditis in the tilapia, meningitis in the tilapia, and uh, gram-positive cocci and diplococci in granulominous inflammation from a tilapia. This disease is caused by Streptococcus NIA, which is a beta-hemolytic streptococci. Other streptococci have also been implicated to cause similar infections. Uh, tilapia, hybrid striped bass, rainbow trout, and many other species are susceptible. This is a major problem for the tilapia industry, and closed recirculating culture systems are especially susceptible. Uh, Streptococcus inii infection is probably associated with overcrowding and poor water quality, for example, high nitrates. Uh, this disease presents as either an acute fulminating septicemia or an, as a chronic form that is limited primarily to the central nervous system. The septicemic form is characterized by hemorrhage of the fins, skin, and cirrhosal surface with or without ulcers. Histopathologically, we see meningoencephalitis, polycerositis, epicarditis, myocarditis, and or cellulitis. Cocci and dipococci are present in the inflammation. In the chronic form, granulomatous inflammation is seen in the liver, kidney, and brain, and meninges. In the chronic disease, the brain is the preferred organ for isolating the organism. Uh, strep streps are ubiquitous in the environment, uh, and it's important to note that strep NIA is a known zoonotic pathogen. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, just to point this out, uh, we, I staged a wound here to make a point. That's my finger. I didn't really get stabbed. Uh, but this other photograph on the right side is, actual, is an actual strep NIA infected patient with cellulitis. This next disease, we see channel catfish with gill necrosis. And in the gills that are excised from the catfish, we see, again, gill necrosis, uh, channel catfish with caudal dermal necrosis. And if we do a skin scraping uh, uh, from these fish and we mount it on a glass slide with some water and we, we sit and we, we wait long enough, we may see the bacteria form th this haystack appearance. And this disease is Flavobacterium columnare, also known as columnaris or saddleback disease. The agent here is a gram-negative filamentous rod. This disease, uh, this bacterium has been formerly known as Flexobacter columnaris or Cytophaga columnaris. This is a serious, highly communicable disease of young salmonids, catfish, and many other fishes. It's frequently associated with stress. Predisposing factors are high water temperature, crowding, injury, and poor water quality. Flexobacter maritimus can cause similar problems in saltwater fishes. This disease usually appears uh, first appears as small white spots on the caudal fin that gradually extend toward the head. The caudal and anal fins may become severely eroded. As the disease progresses, the caudal peduncle and trunk skin is often involved with numerous gray-white ulcers. The gills are a common site of damage and may be the only infected area, affected area. 
The gill lesions are characterized by necrosis of the distal ends of the filaments that extend basally to involve the entire length of the, gill, of the gill filament. These bacteria may be more readily evident in wet mound preparations where they form aggregates with a characteristic haystack appearance as we already saw. Flavor bacteria such as this are ubiquitous on the surface of fishes and in the aquatic environment. In this next disease, we see a trout with gill necrosis and epithelial proliferation. A photomicrograph showing clubbing and fusion, fusion of the gill lamellae. And focal lamellar necrosis with the intralamellar bacteria, which is what the arrow is pointing to. This is flavor bacterium branchiophylla, or bacterial gill disease. The agent here is a gram-negative filamentous rod. This disease can also be caused by other flavor bacteria, such as F. columnari and F. cyclophilium. Fry are the most susceptible, however all ages of fish may be affected. Overcrowding, accumulation of metabolic waste products, particularly ammonia, organic mortar in, matter in the water, and a sudden increase in the water temperature may predispose to this infection. This is primarily a problem of production facilities and is rarely seen in wild fish. Fish become anorexic and face the water current. Uh, we see prominent mucous cell and epithelial cell hyperplasia of the gills, which is evident on both gross and microscopic examination. Histopathologically, the gill is the only target organ for this disease. We see focal necrosis and proliferation of the gill epithelium that results in clubbing and fusion of the lamellae. Widespread necrosis of the lamellae occurs in severe cases. Transmission of this disease is via water because these bacteria, again, are ubiquitous on fish and in the aquatic environment. In this next disease, we see granulomas in the kidneys of trout more renal granulomas, and in the photomicrograph of a trout kidney, we see granulomatous inflammation. This is Renobacterium salmoninarum, or bacterial kidney disease, usually referred to as BKD. The agent here is a gram-positive non-modal diplobacillus. This is a serious disease of salmonids. Uh, other types of fishes are not affected. Brook trout are the most severely affected. This disease has a slow course, therefore clinical signs are not present until the fish is well grown greater than six months of age. Exophthalmus, skin darkening, and hemorrhage at the bases of fins are common. Cutaneous vesicles and ulcers may develop in mature trout, and this has been termed spawning rash. Occasionally, abscesses, cavitation, and muscle contraction are seen. Splenomegaly, renomegaly, and hepatomegaly with ascites are common. The swollen kidney and spleen have numerous white nodules that are macroscopically visible. Histopathologically, uh, the disease is characterized by numerous renal granulomas that contain gram-positive bacteria, and the granulomas may also be present in the spleen, heart, and liver. Well-encapsulated granulomas are seen in relatively resistant fishes, such as Atlantic salmon, whereas the more susceptible species usually have diffuse inflammation. Transmission of uh, BKD is believed to be via direct contact with contaminated fish. It is be it believed that the organism enters through the epidermis and then spreads sy systemically. It is important to keep captive stock away from wild fish. In this next disease, we see a striped bass with splenomegaly due to a granulomatous splenitis. A striped bass in which, if we look at the spleen, we can see the de degrees pro disease progression of granulomatous inflammation from days 15 to 33 days post-infection. And if we look at a striped bass kidney, we see granulomas with acid fast bacterial rods. This is Mycobacterium species, or Pycine tuberculosis. The agent here is gram positive acid fast rod. Mycobacterium marinum, M. chelonii, and M. fortuitum are common pathogenic species for fish. All fi fishes may be affected. It affects both saltwater and freshwater aquariums, and fish fishes raised for food. Up to 10 to 25% of pen raised fish, for example, may be affected, and also wild fish. Uh, currently, uh, mycobacteriosis is a big problem for striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay. Clinical signs of this disease are quite variable. We might see anorexia, emaciation, vertebral deformities, exophthalmus, and a loss of normal coloration. Sometimes we, we usually see long-term, low-level mortality in aquaria. Histopathologically, we have numerous variably sized granulomas in various organs. These granulomas contain few to numerous acid-fast bacteria. The bacteria may or may not be visible with the acid fast stain. Uh, relatively resistant fish species, such as tilapia, will usually have fewer and more discrete granulomas that contain lower numbers of bacteria when compared to a susceptible species, such as striped bass. 
These organisms are ubiquitous in the aquatic environment, and this is another zoonotic disease. Next, we have some trout fingerlings with abdominal distension. This is nocardia. The agent is a gram-positive filamentous rod that is weakly acid-fast positive, unlike a mycobacteriosis, which is usually strongly acid-fast positive. Susceptibility of the organism is primarily a problem in aquarium fish. However, it's occasionally observed in cultured salmonids. This is a chronic disease character characterized by raised granulomatous masses in the mouth, jaw, gills, and skin. And the mouth and the jaw are the most commonly affected sites. The dermal masses eventually ulcerate. <clears throat> we see numerous white raised nodules, granulomas, in the viscera. The exact route of transmission is unknown. However, it is felt that entry through wounds and abrasions is the most common route. Ingestion of the bacteria has been known to cause the disease also. Next, we're looking at some gill lamellae, in which we see individual epithelial cells that are distended with minute organisms. And if we look at a wet mount, we see a cyst-like structure in the gills. This is epitheliocystis, or chlamydial infection. The agent is an obligate intracellular parasite. The organisms stain red with Machiavello stain, as do most chlamydia. Many species of fresh, freshwater and marine fish are susceptible. Light infections with this uh, bacterium are, are usually well tolerated. Mortality most commonly occurs in heavily infected juvenile fish. A clinically infected fish may be asymptomatic or show respiratory distress, or they may also have excessive mucus secretion. Multiple white cysts may be seen in the, in the gill, lamellae, and in the skin. Microscopically, the cysts contain, consist of distended epithelial cells that contain numerous densely packed basophilic organisms. Transmission of this disease has not yet been worked out. Now we're going to stop uh, halt with the bacteria and switch over to fungal diseases. In this first disease, we see a cloudy ulcer in a striped bass, a platy with a cottony growth, fungal hyphae on wet mount, and when you take the fish out of the water, the cottony fungal mat looks like this. This is saprolegniasis, an ulcerative myc mycosis, water mold infection. The agent, in this case, this, these diseases are caused by various groups of aquatic oomycete fungi, primarily saprolegnia, achyla, and aphanomyces species. Sap saprolegniasis affects all species and ages of freshwater and estuarine fish. Most epizootics occur when temperatures are below the optimal range for the species. In saprolegniasis, we see white to brown cotton-like growths on the skin, fins, gill, and on dead eggs. This organism is an opportunist that will grow over previous ulcers or lesions, resulting in superficial infections. It is it's caused by a broad, broad non-septate branching hyphae that produce modal flagellated zoospores in the terminal sporangia. Ulcerative mycosis is a disease in which Atlantic manhaden, gizzard shad, and some other marine fishes, uh, the infections may progress to deep necrotic lesions that can extend through the body wall and potentially reach the abdominal cavity. Fish may die due to osmotic or, or respiratory problems. Microscopically, in ulcerative mycosis, we see intense granulomatous inflammation with broad 7 to 14 micron non septate hyphae. Uh, these fungi are normal water inhabitants that invade traumatized epidermis. Improper handling, bacterial or viral skin diseases, and trauma are the major predisposing causes. In this next disease, we see segmental necrosis of the gills, hyphae in gills using a GMS stain, and sporulating fungi in this photomicrograph. This is branchiomycosis, also known as gill rot. The agent here, agents include branchiomyces sanguinis and B. demigrans. This disease primarily affects certain wild fishes in Europe and the United States. It occurs most commonly in overcrowded ponds with abundant organic matter and high ammonia. Warm water temperatures often trigger this disease. History and findings include respiratory distress and prominent gill necrosis, which is caused by thrombosis of blood vessels in the gills. Microscopically, we see segmental tissue necrosis due to vascular thrombosis and ischemia. The diagnosis is based on the identification of non-septate branching hyphae with intrahyphal eosinophilic round bodies known as aplanospores in and around the blood vessels of the gills. 
The, the mode of transmission of, of this disease is unknown. It's probably present in the water column. In this next disease, we see skeletal muscle from a marine fish in which there is a large cyst that contains variably sized spores. This is ichthyphoniosis, or swinging disease. It's caused by ichthy ichthyophonus hophori, uh, which are large 10 to 250 micron spores that may germinate to form large hyphae, similar to the hyphae of saprolegnia. This is an obligate pathogen, primarily affects wild marine fish. It can be seen in captive freshwater fish that are fed contaminated marine fish byproducts. Fish present emaciated with small, round, and occasionally ulcerated black granulomas in the skin. Occasionally, we see scoliosis. Internally, internally there are numerous granulomas and many viscera. We can also see neurologic signs in freshwater salmonids, hence the term swinging disease. Histopathologically, we see granulomas with insisted large PAS positive spores. Occasionally, we see large, irregular shaped hyphae. The mode of transmission of this disease is unknown. It is believed that captive fish infections are due to ingestion of contaminated feed. Now we're going to move on to superficial external protozoan diseases. In this first disease, we see a channel catfish with focal epithelial prolifer proliferation, which is causing it to exhibit white spots. Here's another channel catfish with ulcers and secondary, caused by secondary bacterial infection. And in this photomicrograph of the gills, we see a large ciliate protozoan with a macronucleus. This is a very common disease, Ichthyopterius multifilis, also known as ick or white spot disease. And most people who have had at home aquariums are familiar with this disease. The agent is a large, this is the largest protozoan parasite of fish. The trophozoites are up to 100 microns diameter, ciliated, and contain an oval horseshoe shaped nucleus. Cryptocarion irritans is considered to be the saltwater equivalent of this organism. Aquarium fish and hatchery reared fish are the most susceptible. Uh, fish become hyperactive in flash or cut against objects. As the trophozoite, as trophozoites enlarge, they cause grossly evident epidermal hyperplasia on the skin and gills. Severely infected fish may have respiratory problems and die. Histopathologically, we see epidermal hyperplasia surrounding trophozoites in the epidermis and gills. Ichthyopterus multifilis has a direct life cycle that goes something like this. Insisted trophozoites, also known as trophonts, leave the fish and settle to the bottom of the tank. The trophozoites, which are also known as tomonts at this stage, on the bottom of the tank divide into numerous tomites, also known as therons. The modal therons then infect the skin of the fish. The life cycle takes approximately four days to complete. However, it can be shortened by increasing the water temperature, which is important therapeutically. This next disease, we see a channel catfish with excessive dermal mucus forming sort of a blue slime. And in this uh, photomicrograph of fish skin, we see a fl a flagellated protozoans attached to the skin via thin stalks. This is ichthyoboto necator, which is also known as costiitis because uh, costia was the previous scientific name for this organism. The agent is a piriformed shaped protozoa 6 to, 6 to 12 microns with two short and two long flagella. These are obligate parasites that attach to the skin or gills via stalks. Susceptibility, uh, aquarium and hatchery raised fish are susceptible. Primarily occurs in cold waters, 10 degrees centigrade, and often affects very young fish when they are just beginning to feed. History and findings, the fish may flash, produce abundant dermal mucus, which is where the blue slime disease name comes from, and or show respiratory distress, such as flaring of the gills. Histopathologically, the parasites can be observed attached to the epithelial surface of the skin or gills. Also, if you look at wet mounts, you can see a characteristic flickering motion of the free swimming form. Light infestations may cause mortality with little microscopic evidence of disease. Transmission occurs through direct contact with the protozoa. This protozoan can swim to the host where it attaches to the skin and gills and undergoes binary fission for reproduction. Next, we have a, uh, a wet mount showing free swimming uh, protozoa that are unattached to the gill. If we look at this uh, scanning electron micrograph, we see a ciliate protozoan with a denticular ring. This is Trichodina species, or Trichodoniasis. 
This is caused by a group of peritrichal ciliated protozoans. They are saucer-shaped, 50 microns in diameter, with rows of cilia at both ends in both a macro and a micronucleus. Viewed dorsoventrally, the parasite appears as an ornate disc with a characteristic ring of interlocking denticles. There is evidence that certain species or strains of this parasite may affect specific parts of the body, for example, the skin versus the gills. This is relatively common in both fresh and saltwater fish and not always associated with disease. Trichodina trotii is considered to be a specific pathogen for salmonids. History and findings. Fish may exhibit flashing and become lethargic. They may have increased mucus causing a white to bluish haze on the skin. The skin may ulcerate and the fins may fray. If the gills are involved, the fish may have severe respiratory distress. Microscopically, the organisms are attached by adhesive discs and denticles to the epidermis. The underlying epithelial cells undergo necrosis. There is secondary hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the gill epithelium. Trichomonads may also be found within the urinary tract, usually as an incidental finding, although they have been known to cause disease in the urinary tract also. Transmission occurs by direct contact with infected fish and or contaminated water. For the next disease, we're looking at a radiograph of a guppy tail with radiodense organisms attached to the skin. In this gill wet mount, we see the organism attached to the lamellar surface. And in this photomicrograph, the organism attached to the gill via pseudopodia. These are dinoflagellates, and the disease is called velvet disease or coral fish disease. Uh, there are multiple species of dinoflagellate. Piscinodinium causes velvet disease in freshwater fishes, whereas amylodinium causes coral fish disease in marine fishes. It's a problem in aquarium and cultured fish. It's not as pathogenic as some other protozoans. History and findings, the fish flash, become depressed, and have lateral opercular movements. The skin and gills are covered by a thick, shimmering, yellow-colored mucus. Microscopically, we see large oval organisms, approximately 80 microns diameter, with multiple chromatophores and a single eccentric nucleus attached to the epithelial cells by pseudopodia. We see gill filament hyperplasia and or separation and necrosis of the respiratory epithelium. Transmission of this parasite is by direct contact with infected fish and with contaminated water. This next disease, we see a carp with ulcerative dermatitis. And on wet mount, if we were due to, to do a skin scraping from this carp, we might see branch colonial ciliates. This is epistylus species infection, also known as red sore disease, especially when it's combined with aeromonas infection. The agent is a branched stalk ciliated protozoan. Uh, susceptibility primarily in wild populations of scaled fish. Outbreaks have occurred in catfish and salmon maintained in water that is high in organic content. Uh, historically, we see ulcers or cotton-like growths on the skin, scales, and spine with red discoloration. The disease may be complicated by fungal and bacterial infections and may be conf confused with water mold infections. It looks, often looks quite similar to water mold infections. In catfish, the lesion involves the spine and bones beneath the skin of the head and pectoral girdle. This parasite has also been observed on the eggs. Uh, histopathologically, one interesting item to note, the parasite must anchor to calcified tissue. Transmission occurs uh, it, primarily a free-living free pro protozoan that lives on aquatic plants and is believed to be an opportunist. This next disease, we see a wet mounts uh, containing non-colonial sessile ciliate organisms. This is Apiosoma species and Glossotella species. These are sessile, solitary, ectocommensal ciliate protozoans. Apiosoma has a barrel-shaped body with cilia at the distal end and a large rounded macronucleus. This disease, this parasite, can affect many species of fish, but it's usually not a major problem. Poor water quality is a predisposing factor. The organisms can appear on the gills or skin, causing increased mucus production and hyperplasia. Severe infect gill infections can cause respiratory problems. These are also most likely uh, free-living opportunist organisms. Here we have a trout with a severely thickened gills. And in a photomicrograph, we can see that there's epithelial cell hyperplasia with fusion of the lamellae. Here we see another photomicrograph in which Organisms are lined up along the surface of fused lamellae of the gill. And in a higher magnification view, we see protozoans with a distinct nucleus and a prominent endosome. This is amoebic gill disease, which is also known as nodular gill disease. 
The agent here uh, include Paramoeba pimaquidensis and Cochleopodium species. This disease has caused mortality in sea caged reared salmon and hatchery reared rainbow trout. A recent report of, has also uh, found this disease in captive sturgeon. Overcrowding and cage fouling are thought to be predisposed to this disease. It may be observed concurrent with or just subsequent to bacterial gill disease. We see marked proliferation of the gill lamellar epithelium that is often segmental, which is what creates a nodular appearance macroscopically. Microscopically, we see gill epithelial hyperplasia and squamous metaplasia, which are often accompanied by granulocytic and lymphocytic infiltrates. The organisms tend to line up along edges of, the, of fused gill filaments. They are visible with hematoxylin and eosin, methylene blue, and fulgin stains. Transmission of this disease is, is as yet to be worked out. Next, we're going to move on to invasive or internal protozoan diseases. And this first photo micrograph is of uh, this first uh, photograph is of a gill wet mount in which we see some ovoid parasites. Uh, we can also see uh, parasitic cysts in uh, hist in uh, photomicrograph sections of the gill. In here, we have par parasites with two polar capsules and forked spore processes. This is Henagaya species, also known as blister disease. The agent here is a mixosome parasite that is characterized by two polar capsules and a long tail-like tail -like extension of the spore shell. Many cultured freshwater fish are susceptible to henagaya. Channel catfish may, can be heavily infected. Typically, we see numerous white cysts on the skin and gills. Cysts can become very large and may cause anoxia via, via gill epithelial hyperplasia. Interlamellar versus intralamellar forms can cause gill necrosis and occasionally death. Microscopically, gill epithelia and epidermal hyperplasia are seen with pseudocysts. We may see it primarily ruptured cysts, for, uh, for, that is, devoid of parasites, in recovering fish. The life cycle of, the, of this disease is unknown. Uh, Free-swimming oligochaete worms may be involved in an indirect life cycle with both asexual and sexual stages. In this next parasitic disease, we see a channel catfish with thickened and irregular gills. This is proliferative gill disease, also known as hamburger gill disease. The agent here is a mixosome parasite, most likely a ranchioactinomyxon species. This parasite may represent the extrasporogenic stage of Spherosphora ictoluri. Many cultured freshwater fishes are susceptible, but pr primarily catfish are involved, and the disease often involves newly renovated ponds. The disease is characterized by a rapid onset with 10 to 95 percent mortality. Water temperatures between 16 and 20 degrees centigrade favor optimal growth of the organism. Severe respiratory distress occurs and the gills are pale, thickened, and irregular. Histopathologically, we see intense granulomatous inflammation and swelling of the gills with epithelial hyperplasia and gill necrosis. The parasite cysts are associated with necrosis of the primary lamellar cartilage, distortion of the lamellae, and an intense inflammatory response with numerous macrophages. The cysts have also been observed in other organs, such as the brain, spleen, liver, and kidney. The life cycle of this organism has not been completely worked out. The parasite is believed to maintain mild subclinical infections in some fish host, or it has an indirect life cycle involving a mudworm, such as an oligochaete, such as duro digitata. Infected oligochaetes release spores that infect more oligochaetes and channel catfish. Transmission of the spores from the fish to the oligochaete has not been observed, suggesting that the catfish may be an abnormal host for this parasite. This next disease uh, is an important disease. Uh, as a matter of fact, recently I believe uh, I heard that it, there's a rumor that it might have been on a board exam somewhere. But in this disease, we see fingerling trout with spinal deformity, fingerling trout with black tails, and if we look at some of the cartilage from the head of these trout, we see necrosis associated with mixozoan spores. This disease does involve a tube effects worm in its life cycle. And this is Myxobolus cerebralis, otherwise known as whirling disease or blacktail. The agent here is a mixozoan parasite with a 10 micron oval spore with two piriform polar capsules. Uh, it affects salmonids, and rainbow trout are the most susceptible. Brown trout and, brown trout and coho salmon are relatively resistant. This is, this is a disease of worldwide distribution. It is most severe in young trout from non-endemic areas. 
Older trout have little cartilage for the parasites to feed on and therefore suffer little damage when exposed as adults, although infected older fish function as carriers. The fish have deformed heads and spines, scoliosis, kyphosis, and develop blackened tails. The pigmentation changes are caused by damage to the sympathetic nerves adjacent to the spine. The fish display a characteristic frantic tail chasing behavior, known as whirling, that can be triggered by auditory stimuli or feeding. In survivors, the blackened tails and whirling behaviors tend to disappear, whereas the bony deformities often persist. Histologically, we see necrosis of the cartilage, particularly the cartilage of the head and spine, with numerous spores present in areas of inflammation. The cartilage, cartilage necrosis is what causes the spinal deformation. This, the transmission is believed to occur through ingestion of the spores or by spore attachment and penetration. The life cycle of this parasite is not completely known. A tubificid oligochete is an important intermediate or transport host. Tubifex worms are infected for life. It's believed that the parasite undergoes sporulation in the tubifex worm and that the parasites released from the worms are infective. The spores develop into sporoplasms and invade epidermal cells, such as goblet cells or mucosal cells. The parasites then multiply and progressively migrate to the peripheral nerves by day four post-infection. Subsequently, they spread to the bone and cartilage. In this next disease, we see a goldfish with severe abdominal distension. And if we open up this fish, we see massively swollen kidneys. This is Hophorellus carassi, also known as kidney, kidney bloater disease. The agent here is a mixosome parasite that was formerly known as Mitrospora cyprini. Uh, it uh, primarily affects goldfish in North America and in Asia. Findings include asymmetrical swellings of the abdomen due to massive distension of the kidney and lower urinary tract and balance problems due to displacement of the swim bladder. Otherwise, affected fish tend to eat and act normally. The course of this disease is prolonged, that is months duration, and fish infected in the fall often die in the early spring with the development of spores from troph trophozoites. Microscopically, the kidneys are markedly enlarged due to extreme dilatation of some, but usually not all, of the tubules. The diagnosis is dependent upon, upon finding the typical miter-like spores or trophozoites in association with affected tubules. The spores are shed in the fish's urine. An oligochete worm has been implicated as an intermediate host. In this next disease, we see trout with irregularly enlarged kidneys, and if we look at of the trout kidney microscopically. In this photomicrograph, we see hematopoietic cells, inflammatory cells, and amoeboid organisms as indicated by the arrows. This is proliferative kidney disease, also called PKD, PKX, and X disease. In this case, the agent is a mixozoan, once believed to be Spherosphora species, but it has recently been identified as Tetracapsula bryosalmonae. This disease causes a serious problem in cultured salmonids, both rainbow trout and salmon in Europe and in North America. Mortality ranges from 10 to 95 percent. Outbreaks tend to occur in fingerlings during rising water temperatures of greater than 12 to 14 degrees centigrade. History and findings include dark pigmentation, exophthalmus, ascites, and pale gills. The kidneys are swollen and have numerous gray-white areas of granulomatous inflammation. We all can also see splenomegaly, anemia, and hyperproteinemia. Microscopically, we see granulomatous interstitial nephritis featuring macrophages and lymphocytes that surround the amoeboid parasites, which are 15 microns diameter and usually accompanied by multiple daughter cells. Prominent tubular and hematopoietic tissue, ne tissue loss are common. Parasites and inflammation may also be present in the spleen, liver, skeletal muscle, gills, and intestines. The life cycle of the parasite is unknown. The marked inflammatory response observed in infected fish and the lack of mature spores in infected fish suggests that the fish may be an aberrant host for this parasite. Here's a rainbow trout intestine in which we see granulomatous inflammation with trophozoites as indicated by the arrow. This is Ceratomyxis shasta. This agent is a mixosome parasite that has conical, widely arched spores. Salmonids are susceptible, especially anadromous salmonids of the Pacific Northwest. We see, can see up to 100% mortality in young fish and pre-spawning mortality in adults. Fish in endemic areas tend to be more resistant than naive animals. Higher water temperatures hasten the onset and progression of this disease. 
History and findings, abdominal distension uh, occurs due to diffuse granulomatous peritonitis. The gastrointestinal tract appears to be the main target. However, granulomatous inflammation may occur in many organs. The vent may be swollen and necrotic abscesses have been reported in the skeletal muscle. Histopathologically, the polar capsules stain red with a zeal Nielsen stain, so they're acid fast. Trophozoites are present in earlier stages of infection that cannot be differentiated from other mixozoans in histologic sections. Transmission of this, of this disease occurs directly fish to fish. I'm sorry, transmission does not occur directly fish to fish, and spores must undergo maturation in an intermediate host, such as a polychaete worm, in order to become infective. Next, we have a wet mount containing cysts containing multiple refractile spores. In the gill, in this photomicrograph, we see focal distension of the lamellae due to parasite cysts. These are microsporidiosis infections caused by organisms such as Glugia, Pleistophora, and Loma. The agents here are microsporidians, which form cysts in various organs. The cysts are filled with one to two micron spores that may either induce hypertrophy of infected cells, such as in infections of Glugia, Loma, Spragia, and Ichthyosporidium, or they may not cause cell hypertrophy, as, in the, as is the case with Pleistophora. Microsporidians are found in numerous fresh and saltwater fish. Some microsporidians exhibit strict host and tissue site specificity, whereas a few have a very broad host range. History findings in histopathology, we see individual or multiple cysts that are filled with numerous refractile spores. Large cysts up to several millimeters in diameter are called xenomas and may resemble neoplasms. Microsporidians are the only protozoans that have gram-positive spores. The spores are also birefringent with polarized light. In Glugia and Loma infections, these organisms infect macrophages and, uh, and other mesenchymal tissues, which then undergo massive hypertrophy, causing deformity of the visceral organs, liver, gut, and ovaries, as well in, as infections of the muscle and subcutis. Pleistophora hy hyphesobricanus, neon tetra disease, infects and fills the sarco sarcoplasm of muscle fibers. There is usually no inflammatory reaction of, around intact cysts. However, ruptured cysts may be associated with intense inflammation. Pseudoloma neurophilium infects the spinal cord, brain, and spinal ganglia of zebrafish, resulting in spinal de deformities and difficulty swimming. Transmission of this parasite is, uh, these parasites are intracellular with a direct life cycle. Next, we have a gill wet mount with ovoid ciliate protozoans. And if we look at a photomicrograph of skeletal muscle, we see that these protozoans are invasive. This is tetrahymena. These are free living oval ciliated 50 to 70 micron protozoans. T. corlisi has been known to affect various aquarium fishes such as guppies and has been also termed guppy killer. T. piriformis targets game fishes such as carp, trout, salmon, catfish, and pike. History and findings include necrosis and hemorrhage of the skin. In severe cases, the body wall ruptures and the fish eviscerates. Microscopically, there is massive invasion of the musculature. The ventral abdominal wall is usually the most severely infected site. Uh, this disease is usually a problem at times of overcrowding and poor water quality, for example, in water of high organic matter. Next, we have a photomicrograph of, of the intestinal mucosa in which we see multiple apicomplexin gamonts. And this is coccidiosis. The agent in fish coccidiosis includes numerous species, primarily of the fam family Imeridae. A wide variety of both fresh and saltwater fish can be affected. It's more common in wild caught fish, but a very important problem for carp and goldfish aquaculture. Uh, coccidiosis uh, infects, coccidia infect the gut epithelium and other organs, including the gonads. Imeria subepithelialis causes white raised nodules in the middle and anterior gut of carp. Imeria carpellae causes ulcerative hemorrhagic enteritis in carp. Imeria sardinae causes granulomatous inflammation in the liver and testes of marine fish. Histologically, we see the fish may be asymptomatic, or we might see epithelial cell necrosis and enteritis in some cases. Inflammation may be more common in extraintestinal sites. The diagnosis is made via observation of merons, mic macrogamonts, microgamonts, 
with or without oocysts. Usually this organism has a direct life cycle. Next we have a wet mount of a, of a, a skin scraping with binucleate flagellate protozoa. This is hexamatosis or spironucleosis. The agents here are binucleated flagellated piriform protozoans. Spironucleus species are closely related to hexamata species. Salmonids and aquarium fishes are susceptible. For hexamata salmonis, younger stressed salmon become anorexic, debilitated, and have reduced growth. They may develop acute enteritis with numerous organisms in the feces. Systemic disease has been observed in farmed Chinook and Atlantic salmon. Systemically affected fish are anemic with swollen kidneys and exophthalmus. Boils on the dorsal skin are granulomas that are filled with organisms. Spironucleosis affects aquarium fishes, cichlids and anabantids, uh, grass carp and other cyprinids. Asy this disease can be asymptomatic or it can cause cachexia, gastroenteritis and peritonitis. Anecdotally, this, has been, this organism has been implicated in the cichlid version of hole in the head disease, which is completely different from the catfish version. Transmission uh, is by ingestion of infective cysts or free swimming trophozoites. In this next photomicrograph of intestine, we see apicomplexin protozoans in parastophorous vacuoles of microvilli. Well, we really don't see them. You just have to take my word for it. This is cryptosporidiosis. The agent here, uh, cryptosporidium species are rarely encountered intracellular extracytoplasmic coccidian protozoans. They infect the intestine of several fish species, including carp, nasal latatus, placostomus species, and tilapia. History and findings. The importance of cryptosporidiosis as a fish pathogen is not really known. It may cause some debilitation and is believed to be a secondary invader in immune suppressed fish. Findings in infected fish may include emaciation and general malaise. Microscopically, the parasite occurs in a parasitophorous vacuole of the intestinal epithelial microvillus. The microgametes are not flagellated. Uh, the importance of this organism as a reservoir for other animals and for man is unknown. Next, we have a goldfish in which the abdo open abdominal cavity shows diffuse granulomatous peritonitis. And on histologic section, looking at the goldfish mesentery, we see numerous small protozoans with eccentric nuclei. This is amoebiasis in goldfish. The exact taxonomic status of these amoeba-like organisms has not yet been determined. Goldfish are susceptible, and we see abdominal distension due to diffuse granulomatous inflammation. Microscopically, we see necrogranulomatous inflammation of the peritoneal cavity and internal organs, for example, the kidney, heart, and brain. Diffuse inflammation may or may not be accompanied by discrete granuloma formation. Often it is not. The parasites are, are associated with inflammation are often numerous. However, close inspection may be required to discern the organisms from inflammatory cells. The organisms are quite small, only two to four micro, they should be uh, microns, and have a central or slightly eccentric nucleus. The natural transmission of this organism has not been reported. Next, we're going to move on to the, some metazoan parasites of fishes. Here we have a goldfish with copepod parasites partially embedded in the skin, a wet mount in which we see the copepod parasites with large egg sacs. Here's a rainbow trout with ulcerative dermatitis. And here's a human hand with blister-like dermatitis. Once again, this is my hand, and I was fishing for that fish and didn't realize it was infected when I caught it. These uh, copepod parasites are Lernacea species, which is also known as the anchor worm, and also Ergacillus, Salmonicola, and Lepiopteria species. Uh, Lernacea is one of many types of copepods. Although most copepods are free-living and non-parasitic organisms, some pathogenic species have specialized structures for attaching and penetrating tissues. All freshwater fish are susceptible, and this is a serious problem in cyprinids such as bait minnows, goldfish, and carp. This parasite invades the skin, usually at the base of a fin. The head develops into an anchor that holds the female in place. The female then develops egg sacs, which are two finger-like projections. Ulcers at the attachment sites are slow to heal. Other copepods, such as ergastulous species, can cause serious gill damage and even death. Microscopically, we see chronic focal inflammation at the attachment sites, this organism has a direct life cycle 
and even the parasitic hopopods usually have free-living nauplii stages. Here we see uh, wet mounts of alien-like arthropods. This is Argillus, the fish louse. Uh, it's also known as branchiurian infestation, and these are not to be confused with sea lice. The agent is a parasite of the skin and, essentially, and occasionally the buccal cavity. Wild or pond-raised freshwater fish are susceptible, and it's common in goldfish and koi. Uh, findings, uh, fish may display violent movements due to skin irritation. Cutaneous ulcers are due to piercing of the epidermis by the refractile preoral stylet, which is a proboscis-like mouth that is used to suck blood from the fish. Focally increased pigmentation may be evident at previous attachment sites, and ulcers may be complicated by secondary bacterial infections. The transmission is direct. Eggs are laid on vegetation or other objects, which can act as fomites if transferred to other ponds or containers. Adults can survive without a host for several days. Next, we have a gill wet mount with a flatworm attached to the lamella. And this is a diagram illustrating the specialized attachment organs of some of these flatworms. These are monogeneans, otherwise known as skin flukes or gill flukes. Monogeneans have been called trematodes, but this may or may not be appropriate according to some parasitologists. Monogeneans affect most freshwater and marine fishes. Many species display narrow host specificity. Predisposing factors for heavy infestations include poor sanitation and overcrowding. The fluke anchors itself to skin, fins, and gills by means of special attachment organs that are known as epistohaptors that usually consist of multiple hooks or sucker-like discs. Low numbers of parasites are usually well tolerated, whereas heavy infestations of the gills can be fatal. Monogeneans feed on superficial layers of the skin and gills, resulting in focal irritation, hemorrhage, and a cloudy appearance due to excess mucus accumulation. Gyrodactylus species are skin and gill parasites with flattened and leaf-like. They're flattened and leaf-like, have no eye spot. Cephalic end of this organism is V-shaped. They have an attachment organ, a pistohaptor, that has two large anchors with 16 marginal hooklets. In contrast, Dactylogyrus species are primarily gill parasites. They're also flattened and leaf-like. They have four interior eye spots. The cephalic end is scalloped, ova are present, and the attachment organ, their pistohaptor, has anchors instead of hooklets. The life cycle of these parasites is direct. Gyrodactylus species are viviparous, and the larvae that are, that are released attach almost immediately to the host. Dactylogyrus species adults are oviparous and produce eggs with long filaments that are usually attached to the gills. The eggs develop into an oncomyricidium that then attaches to the fish. In this next disease, we're looking at some bluegill skeletal muscle, and we see multiple cysts containing parasite larvae, as indicated by the arrows. And if we enlarge that, we see the parasite. And we can also note some pigment deposits in the wall of this cyst. These are digeny and trematode infections. And digeny and trematode infections have also been called black spot, white grub, and yellow grub, again, due, the, due to the pigment deposition in the cyst wall. This photograph happens to be of a sunfish with a, cataract, with a cataract and ophthalmitis due to a certain type of digeny and trematode called diplostomum spathicum which I'm going to talk about in a second. Uh, numerous species of digeny and trematodes affect, affect fish species either as adult worms or as metasocaria. Susceptibility, wild caught or pond fish are most susceptible. Infections do not progress in captivity unless inter the intermediate host is available, which is usually a certain species of snail. Fish are most often asymptomatic, and even high numbers of the parasites may be well tolerated, and Diplostomum spathicum is an exception because of the damage that it causes to the eye. Uvulifer amblopteles, uh, in this, for this organism, we see numerous black to brown spots up to one millimeter diameter over the skin, gills, and eyes. Each spot contains a metasocaria surrounded by heavily pigmented fibrous connective tissue. Diplostomum spathicum is the eye fluke. Metasocaria initially present as white dots. Later, the eye becomes opaque. Blindness occurs in severe infections. Metasocaria are found in the anterior chamber, vitreous body, and in the lens where they cause cataracts. Histologically, for certain digenians, fish are the definitive host, and adult digenians, which, which are not insisted, are usually found in the fish's gut. More commonly, fish are the intermediate host, and the metasocarian stage is observed as cysts scattered throughout many tissues. 
Compared to cestode larvae, encysted metasocaria in parenchymal organs generally incite less of a host inflammatory reaction, and the metasocaria usually have a better defined cyst wall. Transmission. For uvular amblyptilis, herons and kingfishers are the definitive host, snails are the first intermediate host, and fish are the second intermediate host. For a diplostomum spathicum, gills and pelicans are the definitive host, snails are the first inter intermediate host, and fish, usually salmonids, are the second intermediate host. For this next disease, we see the, the abdominal cavity of a fish with granulomatous peritonitis, and if we open up the intestine, we see lots of worms. These are acanthocephalins, also known as thorny-headed worms. Agents here are, are Pomphorhynchus species and acanth acanthocephalus species. Many freshwater and marine fishes are susceptible. Adult parasites live in the intestine. The larval secondary intermediate stage may insist in the liver, spleen, or mesentery. Heavy infections are seen in wild fish. Infected fish may or may not exhibit emaciation and abdominal swelling. In heavy infections, raised subserosal nodules which are the proboscis attachment sites for adults, are observed in the gut. Histologically, we see a severe granulomatous reaction associated with the gut nodules. If the parasite penetrates the serosa, peritonitis may ensue. The life cycle of these organisms is complex. An amphipod is the first intermediate host. In the amphipod, the acanther stage develops into a cystacanth. Small fish are believed to be the second intermediate host, or the peritonic host, for the cystacanth. The life cycle is then completed with the ingestion of the cystocanth and the development of the adult worm in either a fish, bird, or mammal. Now we're going to move on to neoplastic diseases of fish. In this first disease, we see platyfish swordtail hybrid with pigmented proliferations. That is the black discoloration. These are melanomas in platyfish swordtail hybrids. Unique invasive melanomas occur in the offspring when certain F1 hybrid platyfish swordtails are crossed with swordtails. The F1 hybrids with the spotting trait have premelanosomes, whereas the F1 hybrid swordtail progeny develop frank melanomas. It is believed that enhancement of the macromelanophore gene occurs due to deficiency of modifier genes. This deficiency leads to melanosis that eventually progresses to melanomas. In this next disease, we see a rainbow trout with a markedly enlarged liver with a necrotic center. Histologically, uh, this rainbow trout liver, we see thickened trabeculae and pleomorphic hepatocytes. These are hepatocellular adenomas and carcinomas in rainbow trout. These hepatic neoplasms have been associated with the ingestion of aflatoxins in feed. The fry of rainbow trout are very susceptible to aflatoxins. And acute aflatoxicosis also causes acute massive liver necrosis with bile duct proliferation. Hepatic neoplasms, are, primary hepatic neoplasms, are also the most important types of neoplasms in association with environmental contaminants. Here we have an American eel with a cauliflower like proliferation arising from the lower jaw. This is stomatopapilloma of eels, also known as cauliflower disease. Large, ca firm cauliflower-like mashes are, f are seen or observed attached to the mouth. The tumors tend to proliferate in the summer and degenerate in the winter. A burn virus, similar to IPN virus, was reportedly isolated from affected eels. However, initiation of the tumor with cell-free extracts has thus far been unsuccessful. Here we see a brown bullhead with dermal proliferations on the lips and ventral head, and another brown bullhead with oral proliferations. These are brown bullhead papillomas. Papillomas are common on the head, lips, and oral cavity in brown bullheads. There has been a single ultrastructural observation of viral particles in the papillomas, but a virus has not been isolated for this condition. Some of these papillomas may progress to become locally invasive squamous cell carcinomas, as they did in this particular fish. The next condition we're going to look at is lip fibromas fibropapillomas of angelfish. Here we have a female freshwater angelfish with a proliferative lip lesion. It's a little subtle in this particular photograph. This is a tumor of the mucotane mucocutaneous junction of the lips. Only adult female fish are affected. The tumors begin as small white vesicles that enlarge over a period of several weeks. Subsequently, they become firm, lobulated, and elevate the epidermis. On cut sections, the tumors are solid white 
or white with the cavernous centers that contain clear fluid. Histologically, these neoplasms consist of dense fibrovascular connective tissue arranged in whorls, streams, and bundles covered by a thick stratified squamous epithelium. The presence of deformed teeth in some tumors has led to the speculation that these may be adonogenic neoplasms. The cause is unknown, however, a type A retrovirus was isolated from affected, tish, affected tissue in one report. Laboratory transmission of the disease to other fish has not occurred. In this next disease, we see walleye with multiple pale, irregular dermal masses. This is walleye dermal sarcoma. Although fibrosarcomas are common neoplasms that affect a wide variety of, of fish, dermal sarcomas of walleye pike are unique because they have been attributed to a viral etiology. They are also unique because the appearance of these tumors is seasonal in the spring and the summer and because the masses regress in winter. Following regression, there is evidence that recovered fish may be resistant to tumor recurrence. The sarcomas arise multifocally in the dermis and it can become large and locally invasive. A type C retrovirus, a walleye dermal sarcoma virus, has been associated with this disease. This condition must be differentiated from two other proliferative disorders that may be observed in the same populations of walleyes, including walleye epidermal hyperplasia, which is another seasonal disease of walleye that is virus induced. These two, two retroviruses that cause this disease have been termed walleye epidermal hyperplasia virus type 1 and type 2. And walleye der dermal sarcomas also have to be differentiated from lymphocystis infections. Here we have an Atlantic salmon with large multinodular mass arising from the dorsal abdominal cavity. This is swim bladder sarcoma. This disease has been described in a small group of maturing sea-reared Atlantic salmon. Fish present more abundant sluggish. And what is seen is, a, is nodular or encrusting growths on the surface of the swim bladder. The histologic appearance is consistent with a well-differentiated leiomyosarcoma. A retrovirus has been implicated that is phylogenetically distinct from walleye dermal sarcoma virus. Unlike walleye dermal sarcoma virus, this neoplasm does not regress, and its progressive growth can result in the death of the fish. Here we have a northern pike with multiple nodular neoplasms in the oral cavity. This is lymphosarcoma of pike, also known as a sausage lymphosarcoma. This is an epizootic condition in northern pike and muscalunge in certain regions, such as Lake Ontario. This disease develops as purple ulcerative cutaneous masses on the head, mouth, and flank with invasion into the adjacent musculature and metastasis to the spleen, liver, and kidney. A type C retrovirus is believed to be the cause of this disease. Next we have a damselfish with multiple pale dermal nodules. These are schwannomas neurofibromas of the bicolored damselfish. Neurofibromas have been reported in numerous species of fish. The bicolored damselfish has gained notoriety in that some of these fish develop multiple cutaneous schwannomas. This neoplasm possibly represents an animal model for von Recklinghausen neurofibromatosis, NF type 1, in man. The primary lesion in both NF type 1 and, and the damselfish disease are neurofibromas, many of which are plexiform in nature. The fish tumors are often malignant. In damselfish neurofibromatosis, the pigment lesions can be neoplastic and quite invasive, while the cafe spots spots of, of NF type 1 are benign. Neurofibromatosis type 1 appears to be genetically transmitted, while the damselfish neuro, uh, neurofibromas appear to be horizontally transmitted. Next, we have a liver from a sockeye salmon, in which we have mononuclear cell infiltrates. This uh, photomicrograph is of the intestine of a sockeye salmon, showing a monomorphic population of round cells in the submucosa. And this other photo photomicrograph is of the salmon kidney, illustrating numerous blast-like cells. This is plasmacytoid leukemia, marine anemia of Chinook salmon. Plasmacytoid leukemia occurred spontaneously in some farm-raised Chinook salmon. It has been experimentally induced in sockeye, coho, and Atlantic salmon. It's believed to be caused by a retrovirus known as salmon leukemia virus. Fish become lethargic, have dark skin, pale gills due to anemia, and exophthalmus. The spleen, kidney, and retrobulbar tissues are enlarged and mottled. 
Petechial hemorrhage of the cirrhosis is common. Infiltration of the liver, spleen, and kidneys occurs with plasmablastic cells. Plasmablasts have slightly lobulated nuclei and central nucleoli. Next we have a zebrafish, and this is a frontal section, and a brain-like neoplasm has totally effaced the fish's head in this photomicrograph. At higher magnification of the, of the zebrafish tumor, we see swirling spindle cells and palisading polygonal cells that form occasional rosette-like structures as indicated by the arrow. This is primitive neuroectodermal tumor. There was a recent re report of peanut neoplasms in a cohort of young coho salmon. I believe that it's in a recent uh, issue of VetPath. This uh, disease presented as single pink raised non-lobulated non fluctuant masses in the dorsal lateral axial skeletal musculature in salmon. Histologically, these tumors consisted of non-encapsulated islands and sheets of neoplastic tissue comprised of both round and spindle cells with infrequent rosette formation. The tumors were positive for S100 protein and neuroenolase and had ultrastructural characteristics consistent with human peanut tumors. In this single report, it was speculated that the neoplasms arose as a result of congenital defects that manifested during embryologic development. Now we're going to move on to nutritional fish diseases of fish. Here we're looking at the ventral pharyngeal region of several fish in which we see multilobular masses. And this is iodine deficiency. Iodine deficiency in fish, similar to mammals, can cause thyroid follicular cell hyperplasia, also known as goiter. This is a, especially a potential problem for marine aquaria in which artificial salt solutions have been compounded and some of these salt solutions may be deficient in iodine. But it's probably more common for thyroid hyperplasia to be caused by the presence of goitrogenic substances in the feed or in the water. Hyperplastic thyroids must be differentiated from follicular cell adenomas and from rare carcinomas. This is a photomicrograph of skeletal muscle with some degeneration and regeneration. This is fatty acid deficiency, linolenic and linoleic acid deficiency. Fish are capable of synthesizing most fatty acids, but they are not able to produce the linolenic and linoleic acid series. Deficiencies of these fatty acids can also lead to depigmentation, fin erosion, cardiomyopathy, fatty infiltration of the liver, and myxomatous degeneration of fat. Here are some catfish fingerlings with scoliosis. This is caused by vitamin C deficiency. Ascorbic acid is an essential vitamin for fish. Deficiencies of this vitamin lead to poor wound healing, ulcers of the skin or fins, hemorrhage, and skeletal deformities. This vitamin is very temperature sensitive and oxidizes readily in stored feed. Here's a fingerling trout with exophthalmus and abdominal distension due to vitamin E deficiency. Vitamin E deficiency is associated with necrosis and degeneration of skeletal and cardiac muscle, steatitis, and lipoidal liver disease. Here we have a gill with marked epithelial cell hyperplasia with lamellar fusion due to panathenic acid deficiency. Panathenic acid is a coenzyme that is required for the metabolism of fats and carbohydrates. Deficiency lead, lead to hyperplasia of the gill lamellar epithelium and fusion of secondary lamellae. And this has been termed nutritional gill disease. Anemia is usually associated with this disease. Here we have a rainbow trout eye with a cataract due to methionine deficiency. Methionine deficiency occurs primarily in salmonids, leading, leads to re reduced growth rate and the development of bilateral cataracts. Zinc and cysteine deficiencies can also cause cataracts. Deficiencies of vitamin A and riboflavin may also play a role in this particular lesion. Now, just for, to, to wrap up, we're going to look at a few miscellaneous fish diseases. Here we have a trout with an enlarged irregular kidney. And if we look at a cross section, we see this enlarged irregular kidney has a caseous appearance. This is nephrocalcinosis. This disease affects both wild and cultured salmonids, but, mo but is most severe but the most severe lesions are in farm-reared rainbow trout. Presenting signs may include abdominal swelling, exophthalmus, hemorrhage at the bases of the fins, ascites, splenomegaly, 
swollen, discolored, and irregularly contoured kidneys, and white caseous concretions in the ureters. Occasionally, we see cystic dilatation of one or more portions of the urinary tract. Potential causes include prolonged exposure to CO2, magnesium deficiency, and selenium toxicosis. This disease can result in poor body condition that makes the fish less marketable. Here we have a tilapia with clear bubbles in the viscera and clear bubbles in the fins. This is gas bubble disease. Gas bubble disease is due to supersaturation of the water by a gas, which is most often nitrogen. Gas bubble disease can occur naturally, for example, through the heating of the water or photosynthesis, or in confinement systems, for example, if the pump leaks, if pump leaks allow air to enter the filtration system. Fish present with exophthalmia, and gas bubbles may be evident macroscopically in the eyes, oral mucous membranes, gills, and fins. Histologically, we can see ocular lesions such as cataracts, anterior synechia, and panophthalmitis, and ischemic necrosis of the gill lamellae. The fish die due to asphyxiation caused by mechanical, mechanical disruption of blood flow. Here we have a salmon liver in which there is degeneration and necrosis of hepatocytes, enlarged hepatocytes with enlarged nuclei, and inflammation. Here are two of the enlarged hepatocytes with enlarged nuclei. This is net pen liver disease, also known as hepatic megalocytosis. This was first observed in the mid-1980s. This condition affects wild and farmed salmon, such as Atlantic salmon and Chinook salmon of the U.S. Pacific Northwest. Fish present with dark discolored skin, emaciation, lethargy, and often have secondary bacterial infections. The primary lesions are in the liver, and these include hydropic degeneration of hepatocytes with scattered areas of necrosis and regeneration, karyomegaly and megalocytosis in individual cells, and peribiliary inflammation. Other findings include melanization of the renal interstitium and atrophy and necrosis of the exocrine pancreas. The cause is suspected to be a microcystin-like algal toxin. Here we have some yellow perch with spinal fractures, a yellow perch with muscle necrosis, and a yellow perch with muscle atrophy. The arrows are actually indicating the normal muscle rather than the atrophic muscle. This is electrocution, which can occur naturally via lightning strike or can also occur through human intervention, such as through electroshock collecting, short circuits, and aquaculture equipment. The fish present with spinal curvature and difficulty swimming. Fish that do not immediately succumb may continue to feed, but may have progressively decreased mobility. Microscopically, in the acute phase, we see spinal fractures and skeletal muscle necrosis, whereas in the chronic phase, we see de denervation muscle atrophy and contraction of the contralateral muscles. And that is the end of my talk for today. I thank you very much for uh, your attention, and I wish you a good day.